thank you so much for your very thoughtful and you know we're we're, we're already exchanging notes based on um, what you've provided for us today. It, it has been a, a great first step in kind of a broad overview, and so I want to thank you so much for sharing your enormous talents today with us and your thoughts and your insights and really your experiences. It's been very helpful. I want to um, start out maybe with a story. Um, I used to be the Attorney General in North Dakota, so as Attorney General, I had responsibility for um, truth in lending, truth in advertising, and um, there was a industry, I won't mention it, was notorious in terms of advertising, um, you know, stretching the truth a little bit. And so we, we tried to um, kind of come in and, and set some parameters on what could be said and what couldn't be said in, in advertising. And um, I got a lot of pushback. And I said, that's fine. I said, you don't want these regulations. I will eliminate all regulation, all regulation. And I said, but I'm going to take out a full page ad with whatever, even personal resources, every Sunday saying, do not believe a word you read in the paper in advertising. You think that there are laws that protect you against unfair advertising, but we don't have regulations that actually enforce those laws, so don't trust what you read. Well, oh, oh, wait, 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 Attorney General, don't do that. And so my point in all of this is that when the public thinks there are regulations that protect our safety of our children, when they think there are regulations that, that protect and, and, and do the appropriate thing with automobiles, and I mean, I could go down the line with food safety, and then when those systems fail, they wonder why. And we could, we could have a long discussion about uh, the financial system, right? Um, and so we know that there's an essential part of, of this, which is the public's expectation. And how do we meet those expectations without doing what, what you've suggested, Mr. Green, Greenblatt, which is create a completely uncompetitive environment for American manufacturing, for American business, for, for uh, American farmers, which um, I represent uh, the best in the, in the country, if not the world, of American farmers. And, and so we're, we're very interested in all these processes. And so my, I think my first question is to you, Mr. Graham. Uh, I, I think we're very interested in what resources OIRA needs, what powers they need. Obviously, they don't control independent agencies. We have to rely on the regular process there. Um, you know, kind of structural reforms and, and resource reforms that you think might address some of the issues that, been, that have been discussed today. On, uh, on OIRA's resources, my recollection is when the agency was established in the early 80s, it had on the order of 80 full-time career professionals. You can check those exact numbers. When I was at OIRA in 2001 to 2006, we were at around 50, and Mitch Daniels had given me four or five extra. We had been down to a 45 or 46. The last I checked with the OIRA administrator, which was a couple months ago, he said they were at like the 38 level. So I think people should understand that OIRA is a, it's a troubled agency. It's not doing well. And a lot of the talented people who have been there for many years have retired. Uh, they have not had an ability to replace them with, with good young talent. So um, parts of OMB are thriving and doing very well, but OIRA is not one of them. And I think you could, you could have a big impact. If, if you even were able to make an impact on that part of the problem, you would, you would, you would do good things. I want to follow that up with, with um, what I see as, as a kind of case-by-case -case, uh, uh, struggles that we have, which is that there may be a new law passed, like uh, Ms. Gilbert discussed, where, you know, let's just bypass the system and do this. And so for all of the kind of generalized rules that we have, and whether it's uh, executive orders or whether it's paperwork rules, every one of these laws that get enacted, for the most part, require regulation without ever analyzing what the cost will be on the agency of that regulation, and you know that regulatory rulemaking process. And then they may create a completely different process with different kinds of, of um, uh, requirements. And I'm wondering, when you were at OIRA, 
did you ever kind of do a matrix of what those additional requirements were, what some of the reductions in requirements were? Did you ever look at kind of how all of those individual pieces of legislation really affected kind of a uniform system of understanding of rulemaking? That's a hard question. It's a complicated one. I want to draw a distinction between analytical requirements that are placed on regulators and burdens that are placed on businesses of regulation. And embedded in your, in your question is a little bit of both of those. My experience is agencies like the Department of Transportation and the Environmental Protection Agency, they don't have difficulty getting their act together to regulate when Congress authorizes them to do so. They, they do the analyses and they make the, they make the steps they need to. Um, could that be streamlined a little bit so that it's easier for them to regulate when they really need to? Yes, it, but I don't think that's the heart of the regulatory problem. The but, heart of the regulatory problem are the burdens of regulation on the rest of society. But, that's the heart of the problem. But, 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 I, but yeah. I do want to point out, I gave a classic example of where delay in regulation by EPA, who you say is well equipped to regulate, delay in regulation has cost um, my industry and, and, and uh, uh, biodiesel and, and the fuels, uh, uh, the renewable fuels industry, tremendous amount of uncertainty, if not expense. Right, and I guess we would want to look at the question of is that really because of the analytic requirements that EPA has to go through, is that why they're delaying? Or, is there, or are there reasons that relate to the politics of the issue, which is right. why they're delaying? And, and this gets to the heart of the matter, doesn't it? The law is the law. We expect them to implement the law. And when, when there's a different, you know, competing, competing opportunities for not necessarily a change in policy for the administration, but different industries coming at them in different directions, we end up stalemated. And stalemate is the, is the order of the day in Washington, D.C. And we fail to give certainty. And it's not, and this is such a big topic, I could talk all day about it. But, but I guess my point is that looking at this and thinking about um, kind of the overall regulatory process, and maybe Mr. Eisner, you're in better position, and I'm just going to turn this over because we're going to have a longer discussion here, but you're in a better position to kind of respond to this mishmash that we have where we have a generalized rule that gets uh, uh, co-opted in individual pieces of legislation over a long period so we don't seem, you say, yes, but our enabling act said this, so our authorizing act said to do it this way as opposed to um, other ways. And I'm, I'm sorry, your question is whether my, que my question is, when, when we're trying to set an overall you know, process here, and that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, how can we streamline this? How can we make this simpler? How can we guarantee that there is at least public satisfaction that they've been heard? And I, I hear your, your response um, to the senator from Iowa. But, but, but when, when, the, when, when the specifics or when the exceptions then change the general rules, that makes it extraordinarily difficult for us to say we have a process that actually has, um, has, a, has is, is, is working in the way that we expect it to work when each, each enabling act or each authorizing act sets a different process. If there are multiple processes imposed on agencies, and in some cases, I don't, I don't think there are multiple processes, but they overlap, add requirements, they do slow the process down. But there are a lot of reasons the process is slowed down. And when I do a training course, when I initially set it up for DOT, I had two slides with about 15 or 20 common explanations for delays. Some of them, as John said, could be political. Some of them can be incompetence. Some of them can be because they don't have the resources or they don't have the data. Some can be because they made mistakes while they were developing the document, had to go back and start over. There are good reasons and there are bad ones. Mr. Chairman. One of, the, one of the concerns that I have is that we don't want to get in this committee into the weeds on each individual agency or each individual you know, entity. What we want is we want to have the view from a mile high. That's our job on this committee, and, and we've talked about this. And, and each one of these things are very helpful illustrations of what might be uh, causing the problem. But I want to get to the overlay of state regulation. And how much of that, you know, how, whether the federal agencies legitimately or, or 
actually engage in a review of what's happening with state regulation that needs to be harmonized or at least appreciated as we kind of work forward. And we go back to the, the discussion about, you know, automobiles. Well, it was done under the Clean Air Act, but California probably could have enacted a statute that said just like renewable fuel standards, we're going to make all these cars go this way, right? I mean, that's California's sovereign prerogative. I mean, we, we don't always agree, trust me, in North Dakota what, on what California ought to be doing. But, um, you know, that, that we've got to recognize that we're dealing with various levels of sovereignty and, and states' rights. And so we've got this overlay of state regulation that doesn't seem to get very well harmonized with federal regulation. And so what, tell me what requirements are in the law today for federal agencies to actually have consultation, meaningful consultation, with state entities that are regulating at the same level. And I think, Mr. Greenblatt, you'd probably agree that it's, it's the cumulative effect of federal and state regulation that really has you coming and going, because they're not always consistent. Mm -hmm. And so what, what would you recommend to us, what would you suggest to us as a good model for better harmonization with state agencies? Um, it's a great question. Um, one of the things I've been doing is studying how the uh, European member states of the European Union interact with Brussels in this regulatory area. And of course, there's lots of differences about Europe and their structure of government in the U.S. But the one thing they have is they have a variety of processes that basically require I forget what fraction, you know, 60% uh, or two-thirds of the member states to agree on something before the federal government does it. Now, if you take that general principle, now bring it into the regulatory area. Huh. Maybe the governors, I don't know, you pick what fraction of them you want, three-quarters, two-thirds, maybe they should have to sign on to one of these big federal regulations and say, you know, this is a good idea before you do it. And I, I think it's a, a very different way to get participation of the state governments meaningfully. And, and, and what, harmonization. What the agencies will say, oh, we consult, we consult with the governors, we consult with the National Governors Association, but there isn't actually any formal teeth to it, it if you understand. Can. There already was a level of preemption. There's you a know. very strong right, level of right, preemption. Right. And, and so uh, California might, might, if they were listening to this discussion, they would say, well, you already preempted. We have the exception. You can't complain about how we're, we're administering our laws and our sovereignty to protect. No, but they have citizens. to get permission. Under, right. under the Clean Air Act, e California must get permission from EPA well, we, to exercise could, that we, authority. We could, we could talk about TSCA right now and right. what's happening with right. labeling in TSCA. And, and that would probably be a better example because they've moved into the void. Right. So, for example, maybe, maybe, it, maybe a certain percentage of states should have to agree that, um, you know, and sign on to a federal chemical regulation under TSCA before it's done. Oh, wow. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, this, this I mean, if it's such a great idea, why can't you get a good chunk of governors to say it's a good idea? Or the Senate. Many states have adopted streamlined processes where they make those agencies come together because they, they're, they're obviously at the ground level much more responsive and, and nimble than we are. And so those one-stop shops that, that can be great models that the states have created um, in my state and other states, I think, can be good models to talk about how you, how you streamline permitting, how you streamline all of this. I think Gary's yes, yeah. first. I, I, I want to make just, just a yeah. quick point because I, I don't know that I was really articulating my point about various you know, laws that, that change the rules. You know, here we are, we think we're going to set a cost-benefit analysis. This makes sense. Well, we've got an individual statute that says do it this way. How much of that is out there? Is, is my point. How much of this do we think we're fixing a problem? We aren't fixing anything because we have all these mini little structures out there that are in, in law already that, that make it impossible to set general rules. Well, I, I think that um, one's tempted to think what we should do is we should just go into each one of these areas, CPSC, DOT, and, and really learn and study the details of their system and then tweak and refine each of those systems. And I've been working in this area for decades. Okay. If this committee goes down that path, okay, you will, <laughs> not, lies you, will, despair. you will not succeed, <laughs> okay, because there is just so much idiosyncrasy along the way. You need to pick, you know, a couple themes and you, know, you need to try to get them across the board 
at all these agencies, including independent agencies. And there will be some awkwardness in how these things fit with each individual agency. I acknowledge that. But the alternative of thinking that you're going to go in and you're going to fine-tune the architecture in each one of these agencies, that just isn't I, going to be I don't practical. want to fine-tune anything. I just want to know where it is. <laughs> I mean, no one knows where it is. Right. No one has. Well, I'll give you one example, kind of uh, and I wish study. the senator from Iowa were here because she was talking about public participation. One of the things that I think the members should be aware of is that agencies take pop public comment and public participation after they've proposed a solution. And like all human beings, once we think we know what the solution is, we put it on the table. It's not that easy to move people off of that original proposal. They'll refine it and change it a little bit. In some of these rules, it's probably better if the agency says, hey, we're thinking about regulating this area. We're going to do this advance notice where we're going to lay out some data, what we think the problems are, look at a range of ideas, and not lock themselves into anything. Take comment at that stage, and then once they have that, then they go to a proposal. Does it slow them down three to six months? Probably does. In a lot of important rules, it's probably better that they come out and just define the problem a little bit and have an advance notice before they even get to a proposal. Because that way you don't have all that, all that ego behind that proposal. Anything. You know, you made a comment about frequently um, we fall in love with our ideas or in love with our regulation and we aren't going to change them based on comment. I think that what you're hearing uh, from this dialogue today is we aren't in love with any idea. We're lo in love with what works. And, and what you've been, uh, this, this has been extremely helpful mm -hmm. to me to begin to kind of narrow that down, trying to figure out 80-20, um, what's, that, what's that big bang for, you know, take care of the big stuff and, and maybe let the little stuff go. And, and so um, I want you to know this is really an open process. This is really an opportunity to continue to have this dialogue with great intellectual uh, uh, folks like yourselves who have thought about this, who have spent a lot of time working directly in the process. And, and please um, stay tuned because I think we're going to be very serious about this. We hope that it could be one of those places where we actually have bipartisan consensus and um, actually respond to concerns that the American public has. But um, your, your discussion today has been enormously helpful to me personally um, as I try and kind of sort through where, where that uh, greatest opportunity is for collaboration and change.